Welcome back, guys, to the channel. I haven't posted a review in a while, actually. But, uh, the last review was three months ago on the ZR1, which I recently sold to the guy that was actually delivering the car to the dealership that was gonna consign it. So that was actually crazy. The transport guy bought the car when he figured out what car I was transporting. That was actually a pretty wild one. But welcoming my 2012 Lamborghini Performante, one of 180 only made in this car. So color, Bianco, M-O-R-C-E-S, I don't even know how you pronounce it, Morcius, Morcius, very interesting name, but that's Italians and Lamborghinis for you. But Performante, one of 180, like I said. I actually got this car from the original owner with 9,800 miles right now. We're at around 11,000 and some change. So one of the things about the Performante is that it's pretty much a super Leggero with the top off. So what they did was hey, how can we make this car a performance car but still keep the top off without adding too much extra weight? So this car's curb weight is right around 3472. And just to put into reference, curb weight meaning all the fluids in it, the way it sits right now, obviously no passenger. But to put into perspective, a GT3 RS is right around 3300 to 3400 as well. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of how much the power to weight ratio in this car is, which it makes about 562 horsepower, 398 torque, uh, makes all that power at the top end too, like right around the seven, 8,000 RPM range. Similar characteristics to like the GT3 RS Porsche. And the reason I say the GT3 RS Porsche is because that's the last car that I really owned that was a sports car. So it gives you an idea of the nimbleness of this car. Um, the Performante, the styling lines, of course, everything's different, the diffuser. The, the stripes to signify it's a Performante with their special badging, which is like that tri triness of the actual back of the stickers of the car. And then that kind of translates also into the updated taillights, which only happened in the last year of 12 and 13. Uh, rear diffuser, carbon, spoiler, carbon. Also the side skirts are all carbon as well. Um, so we'll get to the interior of the car as well, but everything's pretty much carbon. Crazy, because I have the original window sticker of this car. It's 271,000. Um, the only thing the car doesn't have from an option standpoint is carbon ceramic brakes. Couldn't find one with carbon ceramic brakes. It's nearly impossible. Um, and to give you a reference, too, of the price range and price of this car in the used market, I got the car for 170 with about 9,000 miles. Like I said, about 9,500 or so. And right now there's another one for sale with multiple owners with about 4,000 miles for 225. So I think I did pretty good on this car. I still think in the future, this is gonna be one of those modern classic collectibles. Um, it's not something that you're gonna see every day. And the crazy part is carbon here, carbon door cards, carbon center console, full Alcantara dash, full Alcantara buckets. There's not a single piece of leather or plastic in this car, minus a couple things in the center where the navigation is. Pretty wild actually. Um, so yeah, that's a quick walk around of the car. We'll go for a quick drive. We got to put some gas in it. One of the things that we're going to show when we put gas in is, it's some, that's the one downside of the car. It's the worst putting gas scenario inside a car ever. So the most annoying part when you're getting gas is number one, how this gas is actually fitted, which I just spilled. So you're probably like, how many times does this guy fill up his car? As least amount as possible. But now, you have to have this right here, look. That's you right there. And most gas stations besides this one don't have this. So it won't be on the lift. So you have to sit here for, I don't know, 20 gallons almost every time just to fill up the car. So you're sitting here with your hand. I know it's a first world problem for sure, but. <laughs> Driving review. This is one of those cars that's not gonna be the smoothest. The transmission, it's the last generation of the E-Gear. So yes, in the LP cars, which this is what this is, the LP560 and the LP570, which this is the LP570 Performante, what they did was fix the E-Gear programming in the transmission. They also changed the engine, tra engine and transmission tune in general. So this one just makes a little bit more power than a regular LP560 car. That's a non-Superleggera or non-Performante. But that's one of the things is the e-gear, you really have to get used to it, how you drive it. The all-wheel drive is very aggressive. So if you're in a tight corner and you're turning the wheel, you have to be careful because the clutch will, it will, you will burn the clutch if you don't know how to drive an e-gear. So you can't have the wheel fully turned in a parking lot and expect to do a U-turn. You got to kind of get going straight before you turn the wheel all the way. Similar like a manual car, you got to feel the clutch grab. But yeah.
But e-gear shifts are so violent, downshifts. But ironically, it's pretty damn quick and crisp. But Lamborghini knew what they were doing when they went from the Superleggera to the Performante. I mean, the open air top Superleggera is essentially what this really is, right? So outside of the power that it makes, which we talked about earlier, 562 horse, 398 torque, it really, it screams. It goes all the way up to 8,500 RPM and it makes all that power later in the power band. But, you know, what's very interesting about this car, which we'll throw some B-roll shots in later about the, you know, everything being carbon, but the center is funny because I had a 2013 RS5. That's one of the first videos I posted on the channel. That's still my highest viewed video till this day. It still uses Audi navigation and buttons from the RS5, which is really funny. But one thing about this car, it's very nimble. I was mentioning the weight earlier, right? And I'm comparing it to, people are gonna say, oh, you're comparing a your Lamborghini to a Porsche. Well, you have to compare cars to what you've driven, not compare cars to what other people have said on the internet. Those are two totally different things, right? Comparing a car that you've driven in person to another car that you own or have driven in person is different, right? Most of the cars that are reviewed, I've owned minus a couple outlier cars where people have given them to me so I can review them, right? But for what this is in the generation that it came out in, which is 2012 and 2013, they only did a two year run. They only made 180 of these worldwide. And it's crazy how nimble the car is for being a very aggressive all wheel drive. Here's another thing too. This is the only car I've been in a Ferrari 458 Spider. never drove one, but been in a Spider, and it has cowl shake. And now a lot of people don't know that cowl shake is where the front windshield and the side, I think these are called A pillars or B, pillar, B pillars. The side pillars and the front windshield shake when you're turning the car. So what's happening is the chassis is actually twisting and the cowl of the car actually shakes because the chassis is not reinforced enough. Let me give you an example. You'll see that in a lot of cars. I had an older E46 M3 that was actually a convertible six-speed manual. One of the first sports cars I actually ever bought when I actually made a little bit of money. And it had a ton of cowl shake. Ferrari is the same way. McLaren, I've never been in a McLaren that's a spider or convertible or of any sort, so I'm not 100% sure on McLaren. But this car is crazy because it's a convertible, but it feels like a coupe. And it weighs as much as a coupe, too. That's why I was referencing the weight of why it's so important for this car in particular, right? A lot of convertibles are heavier because their doors have to be more reinforced. The chassis has to be more reinforced. You have roll bars, usually, if the car rolls over or flips. You have all these other safety mechanisms that you need in a convertible because you're not in a coupe. You don't have a hard top. So that's something to really consider. I think Lamborghini, I can't believe that this is a convertible. It feels like a coupe. And that is actually pretty insane to say. Um, granted that I've been in a Ferrari that was a convertible and they drove like absolute shit. Um, but yeah. And there's nothing like a V10 with the top down. Like nothing comes close to that. With that said, quick drive in the car. Don't want to do anything crazy. Not trying to get pulled over. Um, but in all honesty, car's amazing. One thing I recommend if you're looking to get one, make sure you get a pre-purchase inspection. Make sure the clutch life is good. You do a clutch snap on it. A clutch snap is a snap of the clutch to see the wear life of the clutch, especially on e-gear cars. Like I said, the LP cars, the tune is a lot better for the transmission and the clutch system and the transmission system and how the e-gear engages. But clutch snap on my car, this one in particular, was 90%, which is amazing with the car with around, well, I bought it with around 9K miles from the original owner. So 90% is very good, very healthy clutch life. Um, I don't know when they recommend replacing the clutch. I'm gonna assume when it gets around the 60 or the 50 mark. But so far, so far it's been amazing. Car, the clutch is always grabbed. There's never been an issue. Transmission feels really good once you get used to driving it and actually using it and understanding how it works. Uh, because it does take some time to get used to for sure but recommend if you do get a car like this or any gallardo or lp car 
always drive it in Corsa mode because the clutch engages the most in Corsa mode. It doesn't slip because if you're in auto mode or sport, it'll slip the clutch to make it feel smoother. But what's happening, it's slipping the clutch a lot. It's causing a lot of wear. So that's just something to be aware of if you're looking for these cars, either to buy one or potentially own one, or you own one now yourself and maybe you didn't know. Uh, but outside of that, very kind of low maintenance car in terms of outside the major services or if something does go wrong. And when I mean low maintenance is oil changes, spark plugs, and your service intervals. How can I say that just by owning the car recently? Well, one of my best friends owned this car for I think it was about four years. Um, exact car, but it was yellow. Um, never had a single issue with it. Change the oil on time and you're good to go. So anyways, thanks for watching and uh, yeah. Like, comment, subscribe if you'd like. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on the next one. We're gonna make a lot more videos this year. Um, yeah.